各位現場同網上嘅觀眾，大家好，歡迎大家參與今日多元族裔軍人專題講座系列嘅第一講。今日講座會以英文進行。Hello everyone, welcome to the Hong Kong Museum of Coastal Defence. I'm Michael, assistant curator of this museum. Thank you for joining this first lecture of our new multi-ethnic soldier thematic talk series. It is also a program under the LCSD Entertainment Channel. We are delighted to have Mr. Barbara Critchett, PhD candidate from the Department of History of the University of Hong Kong with us. He will deliver the talk title, From Shoemakers to Barlers in Arm, the story of Czechoslovak Bartman in Hong Kong, 1930-1945. Before starting the talk, I would like to remind you to turn your mobile to silence mode, and we will have a Q&A section after the talk. For the online audience, please submit your questions on our YouTube channel. Mr. Critchett will take the questions after the talk. So now, let me turn the things to Mr. Critchett. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thanks a lot for this very kind introduction. Um, I have no other choice but to start uh, this talk with an apology that I'm not able to deliver my talk in Cantonese. I've, I've noticed that uh, all, all of the colleagues and speakers uh, in this series will be speaking in Cantonese, but unfortunately, I haven't mastered the language on a sufficient level yet, so I'll be speaking in English. But rest assured, uh, I have no plans to leave Hong Kong after I finish my PhD, which should be in a couple of months. So uh, there's going to be a lot of time to master the language uh, and become fluent uh, in Cantonese by the light speed. Um, <clears throat> I have a list of people uh, to whom I am indebted uh, and to whom I uh, uh, owe a great um, Great thanks, uh, because they made actually this talk possible. Uh, the first institution on the list is obviously a Museum of Coastal Defense, uh, which not only provided uh, the space for, for this talk and invited me uh, to, deli to deliver the talk, but they also provided uh, resources for some wonderful pictures that are displayed and exhibited uh, in this lecture hall. So uh, those who are here in person, please Please have a look, and uh, all the credit for printing out the pictures uh, goes to, to the museum. Another reason why I'm grateful uh, to, to the Museum of Coastal Defense is because uh, this talk serves uh, as a platform for me to get uh, in touch with experts and historians who are far more knowledgeable uh, in, in the topic than, than myself. This is actually uh, a site research project for me. It's not a primary project I do uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, so I uh, constantly uh, revise and verify everything. And I mentioned some of these uh, experts here in Hong Kong in a second. Uh, the second institution, second group of people to whom I'm truly indebted uh, are Czech diplomats from the Czech Consul uh, General, uh, who kind of unintentionally pushed me to uh, deliver th this talk because, as I said, I'm uh, in the final semester of my uh, PhD candidacy, so I should be focusing on my uh, doctoral thesis, which is not about uh, Batyaman in Hong Kong, but it's good to have some uh, uh, distraction and some uh, refreshment from, from writing, so I'm really grateful uh, to, to Clara and uh, to, to her staff. Thank you, Clara. And then I truly mention, I truly have to mention um, <clears throat> two Czech historians and two descendants of uh, Batyaman, uh, with whom I got in touch, and who provided most of the papers, documents, photographs uh, that I'm using uh, during this talk. Uh, the first lady would be Madame Rosemary Henriksen, uh, who is the daughter of Alois Jiříček, one of those uh, Czechoslovak soldiers uh, whom you will see uh, in my PPT presentation. She sent me uh, a lot of pictures uh, of her father. She, she told me uh, his story, so I'm grateful to her for that. Um, another one is Mr. Oleg Plesek, 
who now resides in Australia uh, and whose father uh, worked for the Batya company in India in the town founded by Mr. Batya. Uh, its name is Batanagar and Mr. Pleshek is an endless source of knowledge uh, about Batya company, the stories of Batya men around the world, not only in Czechoslovakia or, or Australia, but in India, Singapore, Southeast Asia in general. So whenever I need to uh, clarify something, verify something, whenever I need some details, I always address uh, Mr. Pleshek and he is more than uh, willing to help. And there are two Czech historians uh, whom I met uh, in person, actually I met in person only one of them. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Ivan Procházka, who was lucky enough to meet Mr. Břežný, uh, another Czechoslovak soldier fighting in the Battle of Hong Kong. He met him in person in, in the early 90, 1990s uh, in, in, in Prague, and he had a good chat with him. Uh, he had like a, a correspondence uh, with him and Mr. Brzezny gave him all the pictures you can see here in the lecture hall and uh, I'll show some of them in, in my uh, presentation as well. And the last Czech historian I really have to mention is Mr. Jan Hermann from the Batya Information Center in Zlín. I, I've never met him in person but I'm in a constant email touch with him and when, whenever I address him uh, with a specific request concerning the Batya company. He's more than willing to help and he also provided some uh, material uh, for my today's talk. Now, I mentioned local experts uh, and historians uh, who specialize in the Battle of Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong volunteers uh, and the war in the Pacific. In Asia, I, I've listed three of them uh, in, my, in my presentation. Uh, I contacted them uh, and two, two years ago, actually, and they all were really helpful, very much willing to, uh, to share their knowledge uh, about uh, HKVDC, about the Battle of Hong Kong, and uh, all that context which is necessary uh, for understanding uh, how soldiers of uh, different ethnicities got into the ranks of the British Army. Uh, and it is my understanding that they also know about the Czechs who uh, were enlisted uh, as volunteers in, in the volunteer corps. So I started my research uh, with them actually. And another person who didn't uh, wish to be listed uh, in my slide, but I'm Tremendously grateful to him is Mr. Justin Ho, who is here with us today. And uh, he quickly turned uh, to be my advisor and, and counselor, and we discussed uh, some of the slides I'm using today. He corrected some of them, he provided more information. So I'm really grateful to you, Justin, and I'm looking forward to our future uh, cooperation. Now, how I started uh, my, my research, it was uh, a coincidence actually because I was told uh, about one Czechoslovak soldier who fought in the ranks of uh, HKVDC and fell in the Battle of Hong Kong. I was uh, told this story by my friend, a uh, uh, Slovak diplomat actually, uh, who now works uh, for the diplomatic service of the European Union. And he told me that there is one Czech guy who fell in the Battle of Hong Kong and is buried in Hong Kong. But he didn't tell me the name and he didn't tell me where this guy is buried. So this is the uh, actual beginning of my research. I contacted another friend of mine, uh, Mr. Robert Barber, whom you can see uh, on the picture of the slide next to me, uh, who served with Gurkhas uh, in, in the British Army. And he told me that there are uh, two possible options uh, on Hong Kong Island. One is the Stanley Military Cemetery and another one is Simon Military Cemetery. We went to both of them and uh, I was lucky enough to find that there is actually uh, a name of Alois Pospisil, as you can see uh, on, on this slide. I hope it's, it's visible enough. So it actually uh, verified the words of, of that uh, Slovak diplomat, Mr. Lukáš Gajdoš, uh, 
who was right and who directed me uh, to, to, to this Saiwan military cemetery and to the beginnings of my, of my research. Now, as time went by, I was able to identify nine Czech uh, or Slovak soldiers fighting in the ranks of HKVDC. Uh, for, for those who, um, who indulge in listening the Czech language, I can, I can read it loud. Uh, Ladislav Břežný, Jaroslav Krofta, Alois Jiříček, Karel Tomeš, František Staněk, Josef Tauš, Konstantin Mark Vološ, this, this name doesn't sound very Czech, by the way, but, but uh, I clarify that uh, he was born in the territory, uh, which is now the Czech Republic, or Slovakia. Uh, Alois Pospíšil, Rudolf Hoselic, and also Karel Weiss, who didn't fight in the ranks of HKVDC, but there is a connection between, between him and, and, uh, and Hong Kong, so I wish to uh, mention him as well. Now, uh, the first uh, few remarks. The first one is that this list doesn't seem to be complete. Uh, we know from memoirs of Jaroslav Krofta that there were actually 12 Czechoslovaks fighting in the Battle of Hong Kong. And if uh, Krofta's memoirs uh, are correct, uh, there will be three more uh, Czechs, Slovaks, Czechoslovaks uh, to be identified. I, I was unable to find them so far. So if, if anyone has any tip, Justin, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I would be very grateful for, for your help with this. It might be true that Krofta is, is wrong, that there were actually only nine uh, Czech soldiers, Czechoslovak soldiers uh, in the ranks of HKVDC, but, but it's unlikely to tell you the truth. Um, I highlighted uh, three, three names uh, for specific reasons. I, I've already mentioned Pospíšil, who, who, is the, who is one of the Czechoslovak soldiers who fell in, in the Battle of Hong Kong. And, uh, and as, it, as you can see, he, uh, his name is, is listed at, uh, at, the, at the website of, of the Commonwealth uh, War Graves. Another uh, Czechoslovak who fell in the Battle of Hong Kong is Rudolf Hoselitz. And this person is really interesting. Uh, probably he's uh, not unknown to those who are interested in the history of Jewish community uh, in Hong Kong because he has his website uh, on, on the webpage of, of this society. Uh, because it's publicly accessible, uh, I skip most of the information and you can, uh, you can easily access it. What's important for, for my talk today is that uh, Hoselitz was uh, born in 1983 in Žabogreki nad Nitro, which is indeed uh, in Slovakia. And because of his age, he wasn't uh, uh, listed uh, in, in the fighting parts of HKVDC, kind of, but he was a member of the youth division of the same corp, HKVDC. These guys uh, were in their 50s uh, or 60s. Uh, many of them served uh, in, in the First World War, and uh, because Rudolf was uh, already uh, of advanced age as well, uh, he was uh, assigned to this, uh, to, to this unit. Rudolf died uh, when uh, his unit uh, got involved in, in the fight uh, in, in North Point, defending uh, the power plant station there. Uh, he wasn't killed uh, at the spot, obviously, but he was taken to the North Point refugee camp and died uh, at his wounds there. And the last person I wish to mention is Mr. Karel Weiss. Mr. Karel Weiss uh, obviously had a deep uh, affection towards Hong Kong. Uh, 
as you can see, uh, he was born in Prague and came to Hong Kong in 1933. He's also uh, a member of that Batya uh, family. Uh, he was an employee of, uh, of Batya Shoe Company here in Hong Kong. And uh, he was also the member of the Czechoslovak Club, Czechoslovak Committee, uh, about which I'll be talking uh, in, a, in a minute. So he has like many, uh, many connections to Czech and Czechoslovak community here in Hong Kong. But uh, I haven't found his name in the, in the list of uh, those uh, local historians uh, who specialize in in HKVDC and in the Battle of Hong Kong, so probably he didn't fight in the Battle of Hong Kong. If, if you are interested in uh, Mr. Karel, Karel Weiss' works, he obviously wrote two books. One is Hong Kong Guide, uh, published in 1955, and the second book uh, is The Graphics Map of Hong Kong, published one year later. Now, uh, one source of information that I work with are the minutes of, um, of the Czechoslovak uh, club meetings that I was able to find uh, in the archive of the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And as you can see, I highlighted all, all those names who, who came uh, to Hong Kong and uh, who were members of the HKPDC, such as Břežný, Hoselic, uh, Staněk, Pospíšil, Tauš, and also there is Weiss, who was not a member of HKVDC, as, I, as I've already said, but uh, he, uh, he was a member of the Czechoslovak committee. Now, with this very broad introduction into introduction, uh, I actually uh, want to start my uh, presentation about, uh, or my talk about uh, Czechoslovak Batyaman uh, fighting in the, in the ranks of HKVDC. Very broadly, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to start with historical, geographical, and terminological context because all those soldiers uh, that, I, that I've already mentioned were actually born in Austrian Empire. Which is, which is like a different state than Czechoslovakia. Then they became citizens of the Czechoslovak Republic. And during the Second World War, some of them, uh, all of them actually, uh, became state members of the so-called protectorate Bohemia and Moravia. In other words, they were state members of Nazi Germany. I also would like to spare a few words about Škoda Works and Batya Company and their presence in Hong Kong because these two companies uh, have multiple connections to China, to Hong Kong, and they kind of supplied all those uh, soldiers to HKVDC. Uh, then I'll mention four, four short uh, biographies of Batya Men, uh, about whom I was able to find uh, most information. Speaking about uh, geographical and historical context, I also would like to mention Munich Agreement and Occupation uh, of Czechoslovakia in 1938 and 1939, because uh, these two events are really uh, like pivotal moments in the life of Czechoslovakia and in the life of Czechoslovak community uh, here in Hong Kong. And then I'll talk about uh, Czechoslovak soldiers' engagement in the Battle of Hong Kong, their experience, their, uh, their views, and uh, their captivity after the Battle of Hong Kong uh, was over. And if we still have some time, and I also would like to play one video about the Batya Shu Company, I'll briefly mention uh, their fate uh, after the war. So, historical and geographical context. Uh, as I said, all those soldiers were actually born in the Austrian Empire, which later became the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was a union of uh, three kingdoms initially, Bohemian Kingdom, Czech Kingdom, uh, Hungarian in Kingdom, and uh, Austrian Kingdom. It was a military alliance formed against the threat from the Ottoman Empire, which is uh, today Turkey, and unified by, by the person of the monarch, which was which was uh, initially Rudolf Habsburgsky, uh, and for this reason, you can also you can also sometimes hear that uh, the Austrian monarchy was the Habsburg monarchy. In 1914, uh, this monarchy got involved uh, in the inceptions of 
of the First World War by uh, declaring war on Serbia. And uh, this declaration of war in Serbia uh, set in motion uh, all that mechanism of uh, treaties of alliance uh, between uh, multiple countries, but basically two different blocs, uh, Germany, Austria, and Italy on the one side, and Russia, France, and Britain on the other. In 1918, uh, Germany and Austria uh, lost the war, and this was a welcome opportunity for those Czechs and Slovaks who wished to establish an independent state, uh, and they did so in October 1918, and uh, this is how Czechoslovakia, the first Czechoslovak Republic, came into existence. Staying with some maps for the moment, the two cities of our interest uh, for today's talk uh, are Plzeň, and Zlín, Plzeň is the seat of Škoda Works, uh, the industrial concert I will be talking about uh, in, in a second. And Zlín is the headquarters of, of the Baťa Shoe Company. Um, in the interval period, it truly became an interna international city with uh, multiple ethnic communities. By the way, I was speaking about uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, now Czechoslovakia doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it broke apart into two republics, Czech Republic or Czechia uh, and, and Slovakia. I myself was born in Czechoslovakia. I'm old enough to experience that. And actually uh, the collapse of Czechoslovakia is the first uh, event, historical uh, event uh, that I remember. I was six at that time. Okay, so uh, Škoda Works. Uh, Škoda Works uh, were uh, founded by uh, Mr. Emil Škoda in 1859. Uh, it became one of the largest uh, industrial uh, conglomerates, concerns uh, in, in Europe in, in the 20th century. And the portfolio of, of this uh, corporation was incredibly diverse. It was founded as, uh, as an arms uh, factory, but very quickly uh, it, uh, its portfolio uh, uh, reached guns, steamboats, uh, automobiles, locomotives, tanks, breweries, as you can see uh, on some of those pictures here uh, in the room, sugar refineries uh, or, or tractors. Uh, the reason why I'm mentioning uh, this company is twofold. First, uh, as you can see on, on the pictures here in the room and uh, also on the picture uh, uh, in this slide, there was a long and productive cooperation between, between Škoda Works and, and China. Uh, and the second reason is that one of the Czechoslovak soldiers, one of the Batya men who worked for the Batya company as well, actually left Batya company and later uh, started working uh, for Škoda Works and became one of the most important representatives of Škoda Works in Shanghai and later here in Hong Kong. And his name is Karel Tomáš. And the second company I wish to talk about uh, briefly is uh, the Batya Shoe Company. Uh, the Batya Shoe Company was founded by Mr. Tomáš Batya, who was a shoemaker, and now it becomes uh, evident why I chose the caption of this talk from shoemakers uh, to brothers in arms, because uh, the Batya Company was a shoemaking company, and all those uh, Czechoslovak soldiers who worked for, uh, for Mr. Batya were actually cobblers, were shoemakers. Uh, I found one very interesting video on, on YouTube which I, which I want, to, want to play because I think it depicts uh, very well uh, the atmosphere, the optimism, uh, the enthusiasm which Mr. Batya always uh, radiated. The quality of the video is, is not the best, but um, I think it's sufficient uh, enough for, for our purposes. So here we go. And it's in English, so don't worry.
with the eruption of war in 1914 and the beginning of the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918, Tomas Bata began reconstruction of his work in the newly formed state of Czechoslovakia. In a war-weary world, the company faced serious new problems. A shortage of raw materials, irregular production, and employment and payroll difficulties. 1922. Post-war economic depression hits Europe. Agricultural produce prices drop. The less fortunate people had little money to spend. And shoe sales drop drastically. Thomas Bata reduced his shoe prices by 50% on the retail market. His advertising campaign was a big success. 1923. An age of reorganization begins, and the introduction of the conveyor is seen. 1923 also saw the introduction of a plan for profit sharing, related to incentive, quality production, and effort. This plan, said Thomas, will help to elevate the employees both materially and morally. An employee should understand our business, be part of it, and grow with it. A good beginning to employee-employer relationships. Many young people began to take responsible positions and obtain higher incomes, depending on their ability and performance. Only a few years had passed before the Bata Enterprise, because of its growth, quality products and affordable prices, became a leader. Up-to-date stores and distribution facilities attracted people. And the challenge developed a code of good loyalty. The industry grew tremendously under the leadership of Thomas Bata. Thomas spent little time away from his demanding responsibilities. Perhaps on a rare occasion, he would pause for a family outing. On a special occasion in the year 1931, Thomas Bata made this long-remembered speech. Let us not be afraid of the future. Half of the people in the world are barefoot, and only 5% of mankind is properly shod. We see how little we have done so far, and how great a task is waiting for the shoemakers of the world. During his travels, Thomas saw calloused feet and injured feet from lack of care and protection, and saw, in many cases, the disastrous effect of hookworm foot disease. He was determined to produce the best quality shoes and create the largest shoe industry in Europe. Around the industry, he built schools, hospitals, homes, printing and publishing houses, and chemical operations. Shops and factories were opened in many countries of the world. And with this expansion, Thomas found it more and more necessary to travel. In search of new markets, he visited India twice. And in 1931-32, he flew to many areas of North Africa, the Middle East, and the Far East. Then on a fateful day in July 1932, Thomas Bata and his pilot took to the air. Minutes later, the aircraft crashed and Thomas and his pilot died in the wreckage. The unbelievable shock of the event hit Slynn and the whole country. This seemingly unending source of energy and ambition had in fact come to an end. The silence of thousands of sorrow-filled employees Standing en masse amid a complex of quiet factories was a tribute in itself. Millions of people in all walks of life followed with quiet respect the broadcasting of the burial service. Thousands attended in a mood of great sorrow. One radio broadcaster expressed the sentiments of his nation this way. Today, he said, this nation buried its hero. Every nation at certain times has its hero. He may be a king, a military leader, an actor, or a sportsman. This one was a shoemaker. Although Thomas was no more, the leadership qualities, the spirit of enterprise, his teachings and philosophies lived on. The young people whose colleges he founded carried on with pride and diligence. To customers, Thomas Bata was the champion of service, good products, good prices, and fair dealings. To his employees, he was the founder of worthwhile employment, good income, and to the world, an outstanding example of achievement. His fellow citizens hailed him as a man, a man building a better community 
for the future of his fellow man. Thomas Bata's business philosophies were his legacy. These and the caliber of men he gathered about him and had left Kins Lynn at his death. Time is the tester of the value of man, his ideas, and his work. The years between 1932 and 1938 proved the true value of Thomas Bata. These were the years of rapid expansion. Bata manufacturing appeared abroad in Britain, France, Germany, and Poland. Diversification was taking place through acquisition and construction. Restricted exports, quota systems in other countries, and trade barriers made the need to establish throughout the world even more necessary. Batanagar was established in India in 1931. This was one of the first overseas factories. By the time the mid-30s had arrived, plans for expansion were well laid in North Africa, the Middle East, and Singapore. By the end of the 30s, the organization was in five European countries, Africa and the Far East. 1939, expansion to North America and a new era to new markets, new horizons. Okay, I, I hope you liked it. Uh, what's uh, not said in the video and I... Uh, Sorry for technical difficulties. Uh, what's not said in the video uh, is that the video was a promotional video commissioned by the Batya company uh, itself, so it's by no way uh, objective, but as I said, uh, in my opinion, it captures well the optimism, the enthusiasm, uh, bright, positive future that somehow surrounded and permitted uh, the whole uh, Batya company. Uh, but Tomáš Batia was succeeded by uh, his stepbrother, brother, uh, Jan Antonín uh, Batia, who led the company uh, uh, during the time of the Second World War. And, and then when uh, Tomáš uh, Batia's son, uh, Tomáš Batia Jr., uh, took over, uh, Jan Antonín Batia uh, continued uh, with, uh, with his business uh, in, in Brazil. Now, Let's continue where the video stopped. Um, the first shop uh, established, uh, first Batya shop established uh, in, in Hong Kong uh, was in 1929, according to, to the company's uh, newspapers. It, it is unclear if uh, this shop was a permanent installation or just a temporary affair, so to speak. But we know for sure that, uh, that uh, since uh, 1930, 32, uh, Batya starts uh, doing business permanently and seriously uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, he, he starts uh, with uh, selling 1,000 pairs of shoes in 1932. And he's successful in his commercial activities because uh, the sale numbers uh, increase and in 1937, he already uh, sells 133,000 pairs of shoes. In 1937, it is reported that Batya had eight shops uh, in Hong Kong, uh, concretely in the Wu Road, uh, Peking Road, Wan Chai, Nam Chang Street, and China Building. And pictures from China Building, uh, you, you could see uh, in one of those slides. I, I showed you, and you can see uh, on these two pictures uh, on my left side here in the in the lecture room. The year 1937 is uh, important also for another reason. Jan Antonin Batya made uh, his trip uh, around the world, and uh, I. I will show uh, the map of the trip uh, in a second. But on this slide, you can see his uh, personal private airplane, uh, Lagheed Electra, with which uh, he uh, made the trip. It's the same type 
as, uh, as of Emily Earhart, uh, the famous American female pilot uh, who made uh, the first woman in history who made the first flight over, over the Atlantic. Here you can see uh, the whole uh, business trip of Mr. Jan Antonin Batia. He started in Zlín in Central Europe, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, then he went to Venice, Naples, North Africa, uh, Middle East, India, uh, Southeast Asia, indeed Hong Kong, as you could see uh, in, uh, in the previous slide, the local newspapers uh, very carefully uh, recorded uh, his presence. Then he went to Japan, uh, to the US and back to, back to Europe. In my opinion, this, uh, this Batya strip is, is a testament uh, that Batya successfully established a truly global and multinational brand uh, with a net of shops, factories and showrooms in every populated continent uh, of, this, of this globe. By doing so, and now I'm quoting the words of American historian uh, Zachary Dolezal, Batya harnessed the power of globalization, connected leather buyers in French uh, West Africa to tenors in Bengal, to machinists in Zlin, and thus transcended the nation state and prefaced the rise of the transnational co uh, corporation in the later half of the 20th century. So this is the background of the Czechoslovaks who came to Hong Kong as employees of the Batya Shoe Company. Uh, I'll start with Jaroslav Krofta and his biography because uh, Krofta is, uh, is the highest one in the hierarchy here in uh, Batya shops in Hong Kong. Krofta was born in 19... Eight in, in Plzeň, the city of Škoda Works. He joined the Batya company in 1931 after he lost uh, his job at Škoda Works due to the global economic crisis. According to his own account, Krofta went to a local Batya shop in Plzeň, telling the, show keep, uh, the shopkeeper that uh, he would be willing to work for free only if he was granted a job. In March 1931, uh, he was accepted as a shop assistant. As he knew German, he could also serve to German clients, which gave him a distinctive advantage. And only after six weeks of selling shoes in Plzeň, he was sent uh, to the Batya headquarters uh, in Zlín, where he received training for shop managers. With this qualification and experience, he was sent to Hong Kong in 1934. Vladislav Břežný, uh, the man in the, in the middle, was born in 1912 in a small village, Depr, and joined the Batya company in September 1934, working as a supply clerk uh, in the ex export department. At the peak of the Munich crisis in 1938, and I'll be talking about this crisis uh, in a second in detail, he was mobilized and sent to the borderland to defend his post. And you can see him in the Czechoslovak, in the, in the, in the uniform of the Czechoslovak army uh, in, in the picture uh, on the right. After demobilization in October 1938, Brezhny kept working for Batya as a shop manager in various Czech cities until 1939, uh, when, and in January 1939, when he left Czechoslovakia for Hong Kong. And the last person with photography on this slide uh, is Alois Jiříček, who was born in 1913 in a village of Podolí. He joined Batya Shoe Company as the earliest one uh, out of these uh, four in July 1927, only as a 14-year-old young man working in the export department. Before he was conscripted in 1935, he served in various positions in company's hierarchy, displaying a talent for numbers and languages according to his employee card in Batya's company. Following his two-year mandatory military service, he was offered the position of deputy manager for Batya shops in Hong Kong, for which he departed in October 1937. And Karel Tomáš, the person uh, whom I've already mentioned, uh, was born in uh, 1902. Uh, I was unable to find his interwar picture, but I'll show you uh, his uh, afterwar 
picture uh, in one of those, uh, in uh, one of uh, my uh, last slides. He was born in 902 in Brno, the second biggest city uh, of the Czech Republic. According to his own uh, curriculum vitae, Tomáš left Czechoslovakia for Shanghai in uh, 1931, where he worked as a correspondent of the Holland China Trading Company. In 1933, he became employee of Batya in Hong Kong, but uh, left this company uh, at the same year and started working for the Škoda Works again in Shanghai. When the Japanese attacked Shanghai in 1937, Tomesh moved uh, the Škoda office from Shanghai to Hong Kong. Now, the Munich Agreement in September 1938, I already mentioned the so-called Munich crisis uh, in connection uh, with Brzezny, and uh, the outcome of this crisis was uh, the so-called Munich uh, Agreement. This agreement is the real watershed in the history of uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, because it ceded uh, the Czechoslovak borderland inhabited uh, by the German minority to Nazi Germany, and Czechoslovakia lost one third of its territory. This agreement was uh, later followed by the so-called Vienna Award, which granted the southern uh, regions of Slovakia uh, to, to Hungary. And in November 1938, uh, Poland as the third state participating in partitioning of Czechoslovakia in 1938 uh, occupied a small county in the uh, northeastern region of Czechoslovakia, Cieszyn. Now, shortly after the uh, Munich Agreement was signed, the Czechoslovaks uh, in Hong Kong established the so-called Czechoslovak Club, but also, uh, I also seen uh, the title Czechoslovak Com Committee in, in some of those primary sources. And this committee sent a memorandum to, to the British governor uh, in Hong Kong uh, in which the Czechoslovaks uh, protested and rejected uh, the Munich Agreement and uh, started uh, taking actions uh, against it. According to the minutes from uh, one of the meetings of this committee of this club that I've already uh, showed you, the committee had 37 members, 22 men, eight women, and uh, seven other members of the Russian origin. The club was chaired by a free member directorium with František Staněk as the chairman and Václav Haag and Jaroslav Kuril as vice chairman. And I'll mention these to names uh, in another connection shortly. The immediate goal of this club was to organize a series of lectures in which the Czechoslovaks, the members of this club, uh, presented their view on the Munich Treaty, Hitler's policy, and injustices that were done on Czechoslovakia. In the long term, uh, the goal of this club was to support restoration, restoration of Czechoslovakia in pre-Munich borders, propagate Czechoslovak culture in Hong Kong, write articles into local newspapers, and contribute financially to the war efforts of allied governments. Another milestone in the history of Czechoslovakia is the occupation of Czech lands, Czechia, in March 1939. Uh, on uh, 15th of March 1939, uh, the German army crossed uh, the borders of the so-called Second Czechoslovak Republic and occupied uh, the remnants uh, of Czechoslovakia, Bohemia and Moravia. And one day later, on the 16th of uh, March, Adolf Hitler declares the so-called protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia and kind of in incorporates uh, the Czech lands into, into Germany. I'm mentioning uh, this event for uh, two reasons that are uh, not uh, obvious at the first glance. Uh, until 15th of March uh, 1939, these Czechoslovaks in Hong Kong are citizens of the Czechoslovak Republic. But after this date, they become the state members of, of the third 
Reich. And once they are uh, enlisted in, in the British Army and the British Empire uh, declares war uh, on, on Germany, those Czechoslovaks fighting in the ranks of the British Army become traitors and can be, uh, can be shot without, without any trial. And the second reason is that these Czechoslovaks represented a potential risk for uh, local Hong Kong authorities, because uh, as we know, Hong Kong was under British administration. And once again, once uh, Britain declared war uh, on Germany, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't be sure if the loyalty of these Czechoslovaks uh, belonged to Germany or to the Allied governments. And according to Brezhnev's uh, memoirs, this was indeed uh, the reason uh, why the security clearance of those Czechoslovaks who volunteered for the HKVDC ranks uh, took uh, four months from September when the war in Europe uh, broke out till January 19, 1940. And I also said that I would mention uh, names of Jaroslav Kuril and Václav Haag once, once again. Uh, these two Czechoslovaks who were uh, brewmasters in, in the local brewery built by the Škoda Works were uh, two uh, Czechs who decided to opt for, for the protectorate citizenship and uh, were interned in, in Hong Kong uh, for for the rest uh, of war uh, in, in 1941, I mean, uh, when, uh, before Hong Kong was taken by the, Japanese, by the Japanese forces. Now, the occupation of uh, Czechoslovakia in 1939 uh, is the last drop for those uh, Czechs uh, who worked for the Batya Company uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, they all volunteered for, for the service in the HK, HKVDC and uh, were trained to use uh, light and heavy machine guns and also uh, these wonderful uh, brand carriers, uh, which were actually uh, light tanks. Uh, on the picture, you can see Jaroslav Brezhny marked by the arrow, and I personally think that, uh, that this person here is Alois Jiříček. If you can compare this face with this face, uh, this is sure that this is Jiříček because uh, it's from his employee card from, from the Batya Shoe Company. I think there's an 80% chance that it's the same person. I asked uh, Mr. Jiříček's uh, daughter, uh, Rosemary, uh, about her opinion, but she wasn't sure, so I cannot be sure either, but uh, I think the chance is is quite high. The training uh, of uh, these Czechs, uh, as Brezhny recalls, uh, took place every Monday and Friday uh, after work, and twice a year there were uh, week-long mil military maneuvers to practice complex, complex military operations. In November 1941, uh, the mobile uh, mobile machine gun company uh, to which uh, these Batya men uh, were initially assigned was disbanded, disbanded and half of the personnel, uh, including uh, all those Czechs, were uh, assigned to the second uh, Scottish machine gun company. And uh, I think uh, this picture is more or less from this era. Justin, please correct me if, if I'm wrong. OK. <laughs> because I'm kind of running out of time, only briefly, I'll mention the engagement of uh, these Czechoslovaks uh, in, in, the, in the Battle of Hong Kong. Uh, the course of the battle is well known. I would say the Japanese attacked Hong Kong on the 8th uh, of December 1941 and took over Kowloon in four days since the invasion. On the 8th, uh, sorry, on, on the 18th of December, uh, the Japanese successfully landed on Hong Kong Island, pushing the Brezhnev's unit to Stanley Peninsula, as you can see on this picture. Brezhnev says that on 22nd December, his unit was cut off from the main force, uh, which defended the city, and thus lost, lost contact with uh, the headquarters. The last hours of Brezhnev's uh, unit's resistance uh, are recorded by Brezhnev as 
such. On Christmas Eve, December 24th, our platoon was sent on patrol. We were divided into two squads, uh, which then proceeded up a very steep hill and searched for the Japanese. Around midnight, we, were unknowingly, we unknowingly crossed the Japanese line. The Japanese, who were hiding in the trees, let us pass, and when we were about 50 meters away, they opened fire. During this firefight, we lost our fellow soldier, Aros Pospicil. The losses were significant. Barely half of our platoon survived. And Yaroslav Krofta adds to this Brzezny's account one interesting detail. He says that uh, next to the advantage of outnumbering the Hong Kong defenders six to one, the Japanese also took advantage of their rubber shoes, which produced little noise and thus enabled the Japanese to move very quickly and quietly. Hong Kong capitulated on 25th December and Brzezny's unit was disarmed uh, at Stanley Form Fort the same day and was sent to the POW camp in North Point. You can see the location of this, of this camp uh, on, on the map. The impression Brzezny had about uh, this camp is this. North Point camp was a collection of wooden barracks. The 11 kilometer march of tired sleep-deprived and hungry soldiers under Japanese bayonets was like a horrible nightmare for us. By evening, we finally reached these wooden barracks, where each barrack had room for 50 people, but they crammed 160 of us in there. The rest of the space above our heads was filled with millions of flies, the source of our first sickness, dysentery. Despite this, Brzezny continues, the first few days of being taken prisoners didn't seem too tragic. The Japanese, who had just captured Europeans for the first time, didn't yet know what to do with us. The first five or six days, also food wasn't too bad, since we managed to use our military rations. We hoped that we would soon be liberated by either the Japanese or the Allied army. But these beautiful dreams, hopes, and rosy moods didn't last long. And Krofta, in his diary, adds to these Brzezny's memoirs this. My wife, who had no idea if I was still alive, as soon as she found out where the prisoners were being held, went with a group of other women to see if I was among them. These Japanese, the Japanese were not prepared for such a visit and did not know how to handle it. Before they figured it out, we were hugging each other, quickly sharing our experiences and joy that we were still alive. This was the last time before the end of war when I saw my wife. Now, two years ago, I firstly contacted uh, the Museum of Coastal Defense and I was able to, to get uh, Mr. Krofta's uh, letter, uh, which he sent to uh, his wife from uh, Shamshui Po, POUW camp, uh, where Krofta and uh, his unit was transferred from the North Point camp. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the courtesy of the, most, uh, of the Museum of Coastal Defense for, for sharing this. Um, as you can see, it's a, it's a very simple message, uh, definitely the su subject of censorship, uh, but at least Krofta could let uh, her wife know that uh, he is still alive. Now, I already mentioned Tomáš. Uh, Tomáš, Wolosh, and Taos uh, were in the group uh, who were sent from the Shamshui Po uh, POW, POW camp to Japan, to a local uh, camp for uh, prisoners of war uh, in, in Sendai. And I'm mentioning this uh, because this is another proof that uh, there were uh, Czechs fighting in the ranks of, of the HK VD, VDC. And uh, an interesting uh, connection uh, between, between Tausch and uh, 
sorry, between Macau and the Czech Republic, because Tausch is listed uh, as, as one who actually lived uh, in Macau and not the Czech Republic, but his nationality, obviously, is Czech. And this is the picture of the coal mines of the prisoners' camp uh, in Sendai, where Tomes, uh, Tausch, and Volos had to, had to work. In last few minutes, um, I can wrap up with the after-war fates of those four uh, Czechoslovaks, uh, whose stories helped me to uh, tell my story and, and the story of, uh, of, this, of this lecture. Jaroslav Krofta uh, left Hong Kong uh, in 1945 as uh, all those prisoners of war. He was sent uh, on, on vacation. He went to Canada uh, with his wife, uh, where uh, they stayed almost uh, half a year. In the summer of 1946, they returned to Hong Kong uh, via United States and Panama. And back, back in Hong Kong, Krofta was tasked with restoring the sales uh, network uh, of pre, uh, to pre-war uh, levels. But since Batya Company was nationalized uh, in uh, 1946, if I remember well, the project was abandoned. And in 1947, Krofta returned back uh, to Czechoslovakia with uh, his wife and his daughter who was born in Hong Kong in the meantime. Řežný went also on vacation uh, to Czechoslovakia in 1946, uh, where he had lectures about his wartime experience in Hong Kong. He came back to Hong Kong in 1947 and again volunteered for the Royal Hong Kong Defense Corps. He remained in this uh, corp uh, until 1953, when he was awarded the Efficiency Medal by the, government, by the governor of Hong Kong, Sir, uh, Sir Alexander Grantham. In 1953, Brzezny also became a British citizen, and he retired from the ranks of uh, Royal Hong Kong uh, Defen Defense Corp in 1954 when he moved to Thailand and started working for Mr. Batya once again. He died uh, in 1996 in Australia, but before that he uh, managed to visit uh, the Czech Republic in 1994 uh, and took this wonderful picture. Similarly to Břežny, uh, also Alois Jiříček uh, returned to Czechoslovakia in 1946 uh, and married there uh, Miss Angela Folnerová. Shortly after this, uh, he was asked by Mr. Batya to go to Shanghai uh, and took over the Batya Shoe Company in China. Jiříček accepted and took his wife to Shanghai with him, where uh, their two uh, daughters, Rosemary and Helenka, uh, were born. In Shanghai, Jiříček experienced the unfortunate realities of the ongoing uh, Chinese civil war and was briefly captured by an unknown guard unit in the Batya building in Shanghai. Upon his release, he decided to leave China for Singapore, uh, which he reached uh, after an adventurous odyssey in 1950. He resumed his duties uh, with Batya once again and ended his fruitful career at the Batya Shoe Company in Malaya in 1974. Afterwards, uh, he moved uh, to Australia, where he passed away in 1987. And Karel Tomes uh, didn't leave any diary or witness account, but I was able to obtain memoirs uh, of Tomes' son, Igor, who says about uh, Tomes' captivity in Sendai and about his afterwar uh, fate this. In 1944, my father was deported from Shamshuipo with Canadians to northern Japan. Towards the end of the war, he contracted typhus and he was saved by the Americans who liberated their camp. He was taken to the Central American Military Hospital in Manila. We didn't meet my father until mid-February 1946, and that's when the war actually ended for us. We were repatriated by aircraft courier 
to Glasgow, where we underwent quarantine at the Canadian Red Cross camp. And after four weeks, we returned home. From the suffering he endured, my father developed hypertrophy of the heart muscle and he suffocated. He died on July 1st, 1952, at the age of less than 50. Now, the very last slide uh, I wanted to show you is this. Uh, I've noticed that uh, here in the Museum of Coastal Defense, they have a perfect uh, exemplary of the brand machine gun, but actually no one knows that this machine gun was originally designed in Czechoslovakia as early as 1926. And I was able to find this, this beautiful picture of the Chinese soldiers using uh, this, this machine gun probably uh, during the 19, 1930s. So this would be all. Thanks a lot for your attention, for uh, your uh, uh, patience with me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you, if you have any questions, uh, and I know the answer, of course, I would be very much happy uh, to, to give you the answer right now. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you for introducing the history of Czech Koslovak community during the interwar period and during the war. So let's move to the Q&A section. Please let us know if you have questions. Or we can switch to the online questions first. Some on our audience would like to know were those Czechoslovak you mentioned trained before they joined the HKVDC? Did they have training in their home country before they come to Hong Kong or they just have the military training after they joined the HKVDC? Oh yes, we, we discussed this with Justin a, a little bit. Uh, as you can see on the on the example of, of Brzezny, uh, who is in the Czechoslovak uh, military uniform, all those guys had to had to go through the military mandatory military training uh, in the Czechoslovak army. Uh, it took them two years uh, to to be trained. The military service was compulsory for, for two years, so they had the basic knowledge how to use how to use weapons, how to use how to use arms, and they definitely capitalized on uh, on, on this experience in the Czechoslovak army. And as I said uh, before, uh, the war broke out. In, in Hong Kong, in, in the Pacific, uh, these Czechoslovak soldiers were trained in the ranks of the British Army to use British equipment, uh, British uh, tanks, British weapons, and so on. I see. Then I think it's uh, interesting corrections. The audience would like to know how big was the Czechoslovak Cup in Hong Kong and what they do? Well, as, as I said, uh, the... the Community was rather small in in Hong Kong. Uh, definitely not hundreds, uh, maybe tens of Czechoslovaks uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, the club had 37 members, uh, if I remember the numbers well. Uh, 22 men, eight women, and uh, seven members of of Russian origin. And uh, what did they do? Uh, as I said, they uh, protested against the Munich Agreement. They did their utmost uh, to bring the cause of Czechoslovakia to, to Hong Kong attention. Uh, they propagated uh, Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak culture. Uh, I remember I, I saw in one of those uh, minutes that uh, at the occasion of the death of the first Czechoslovak president, uh, Mr. Masaryk. Uh, they introduced uh, his life to the local audience. They played some Czech classic music, you know, so these culture uh, activities. And they also supported uh, the war effort of the allied governments when when the war broke up, they donated they donated money, uh, and I think in the SCMP there there are many articles uh, about this. So if someone is interested, uh, SCMP is a good source uh, to delve deeper into this. Okay, thank you. Mm, you have mentioned that you haven't 
uh, I don't know if you're on this topic before you come to Hong Kong. Uh -huh. So how did you discover this topic in the first place? Oh, as I, as I said, uh, I, I have a friend, uh, a Slovak diplomat, Mr. Lukáš Gajdoš, uh, who somehow knew that there was one Czechoslovak soldier uh, buried here uh, in Hong Kong and who uh, fought in the ranks of the HKVDC. So he told me about that. I was, of course, fascinated by, this sto by the story. So I contacted local historians. Uh, I did some private research on that matter. I visited uh, the cemetery. I discovered that my Slovak friend was right. So this was the beginning. And then uh, the historical research started. Thank you. In the of the time, I think you will be the last questions. So, any interesting happens during your research? Interesting things you have found in this topic? Well, I, I find interesting things all the time. <laughs> uh, for instance, I, I, I had absolutely no idea that uh, cooperation between between China and Škoda Works uh, was so fruitful and so productive. Uh, when I was preparing uh, for my talk, I I only discovered that uh, the Škoda Works supplied steamboats, uh, they supplied locomotives, they supplied tractors uh, to China. So, so there is always something new. Uh, probably the biggest benefit for me in this uh, is meeting new people uh, like Justin, but, but also some archivist, uh, archivists uh, in Czech Republic archives who are more than willing to, to share, to help, which is, which is really nice. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm learning during the process and I'm meeting new fa fantastic people and that's the biggest benefit of the research for me. Thank you. I think it is a very interesting topic. So I think it's a good place to end. Thank you again, Pavel. And please be reminded that this talk will be on our YouTube channel. You're welcome to repay it on our YouTube anytime. Thank you for joining. Have a nice day.